The Carbon Tracker Initiative mirrors the United Nations exactly. They're, 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 they're lined up perfectly well. They want to reduce the extraction of coal and oil to zero by 2030. To zero. That means no more oil come out of the ground, no more, no more coal be dug out of the ground. <clears throat> What's astounding to this, I can only speak for the United States right now, but 67% of our energy comes from oil and coal, period. 67%. Only 7% comes from other things like wind and solar. And so while these guys are busily making haste to destroy the, the brown industry, if you will, they have no viable plan to replace the energy deficit that they're creating. None. They really don't. And I thought, well, that's silly. Of course, they think they're going to build windmills all over the world or something. But uh, Bill Gates, who is big into global warming issues right now, he said um, he wrote a piece uh, or an had an interview a few weeks ago. And he said uh, that we need more R&D. That's what we need. And the governments need to step up to the plate and put up all kinds of money and just give it to private industry. <laughs> give it to private industry. Get that part to go out and do R&D and come up with solutions on how we can increase the alternative energy and replace this stuff. And you know what? They don't have, he said, we don't have anything on the plate right now that would really do it, but he's hoping for a miracle. That's what he said. He used that word, miracle. It, it, I'm hoping for a miracle. Well, okay, they're destroying the oil industry. They're destroying the coal industry to get rid of all that bad CO2-based stuff. They're creating a huge energy, energy deficit. If it's not filled, the world will be back in the dark ages again, literally. And they have no plan, and the best they can do is hope for a miracle. That's not a good equation. No. This is, in fact, this is insanity. And I, It's, in I, fact, I, genocidal. Um, if it, you it cannot, is. Yes, if you cannot replace this huge, glaring energy deficit that is going yes. to be created by this plan, it, there are people who will literally die from this, as there have been, for example, in recent years in the UK, people literally dying from cold winters as this entire global movement is being set up to try to uh, stop it's, the world from warming. It is insanity, but it is an insanity that appeals to people at a, at a very basic level that a lot of people have signed on to. Sustainable development sounds like a good thing to a lot of people because it's phrased in this language that comes with a lot of, you know, warm, fuzzy rhetoric. And it's talking about saving the planet. And everyone knows carbon dioxide is the global thermostat for the entire globe. And it, it will either warm up the planet to, uh, or we can, we can turn that back down by get, getting rid of carbon. Of course, this is the kind of thinking that's been inculcated in the public. So I think we have to confront this squarely head on to show that it is not such a straightforward equation. So how do we go about even beginning to broach this subject? You know, when I was in the first grade, one of the experiments our teacher had, she brought out a little paper cup. We didn't have styrofoam back in those days. She brought a little paper cup. We put some dirt in it, and she passed around a lima bean to every student, stuck the lima bean down in the dirt, put a little water on it. And she said, now you watch what happens. You know, we're going to follow along with it. You watch every day we're going to come in and we're going to check our little bean and see what's going on. She explained to us the whole, <clears throat> the whole, uh, you know, the whole Monty of, of uh, you know, how life, how life works and stuff. She explained photosynthesis. She explained the life cycle, how the, the plants give off carbon, uh, give off oxygen. We breathe the oxygen. We give off carbon dioxide so the plant can grow. And it was a wonderful thing. And we understood it. A first grader can understand how the world works. These people can't seem to figure this out. We need carbon dioxide. And listen, if we could do what they want to do, they would like to reduce carbon dioxide down to almost just minimal levels where there's virtually none in the atmosphere. If we did that, James, we would sterilize the earth, sterilize the earth. The plants would die. The oxygen would be breathed up. And with no way to replace it, we would die. This is absolute nearsighted insanity. It's just crazy talk. Nobody has ever died out in the open, in any case, because of an overdose of carbon dioxide. That's stupid. Carbon monoxide, yes, but it's not the same. When, when I was a, a young guy in the farming industry in California, they pretty much had kind of invented the big tomato greenhouses back in those days, big, the hothouses, they called them. They were huge. Sometimes they're 
hundred yards long, a big dome shaped buildings. First thing they would do when they put everything and all equipment in, they would put in a big fan and a CO2 concentrator at the end of the building and they would blow enriched uh, air enriched with carbon dioxide to enrich the air so the plants would grow faster. We never lost one worker, not one, ever, in, the, in those hothouses. And the fact of the matter is, if we actually would increase the level of CO2 in the world today, agricultural output would skyrocket. Again, unfortunately, this is something that's difficult for people to understand because we have been told that it is a corporate uh, sort of oil oil industry argument to argue, argue against this. Whereas, in fact, I think the question that is never asked by these same people is who is behind the other side of this equation? Who is behind the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and the other bodies that are promoting this uh, this brand of austerity that people are seemingly embracing wholeheartedly. And I think this is something that you talk about uh, uh, quite effectively in uh, Technocracy Rising. So let me just quote a, a passage that I think is particularly pertinent. You, you say, for example, the Rio Declaration, uh, talking about the Rio Earth Summit Conference in 1992, also produced three legally binding agreements that were open for signature by participating nations. First, there was the Convention on Biological Diversity that covered ecosystems, species, and genetic resources, and that ultimately produced the massive 1,140-page Global Biodiversity Assessment Document. Second, there was the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, Change, which, of course, is the body governing the COP Conference of the Parties that's coming up in Paris. And third, there was the United Nations Conventions to Combat Desertification. During the Rio conference, then-Secretary General of the UN, Boutros, uh, Boutros Boutros Ghali, also called for the creation of the Earth Charter, which was later completed and published on June 29th, 2000. And it has such warm, fuzzy rhetoric as, we stand at a critical moment in Earth's history, a time when humanity must choose its future, and other such uh, dramatic language. And you go on to note, it is not coincidental that the principal author of the Earth Charter was Stephen C. Rockefeller, the son of the former vice president Nelson Rockefeller and nephew of David Rockefeller. And it is interesting how often these types of bodies and their pronouncements go back to the the very same families that are the oil industry, the Rockefellers. There is no name that is more com closely associated with the history of oil than the Rockefellers, and yet they are at the heart of the UN uh, takeover of, of the, the planet through this carbon agenda. How do we reconcile that seeming paradox? It has been their agenda from 1973 when the Trilateral Commission was formed to create a new international economic order. That's what they said back then. It was all over their literature. And the only thing new that's come along since the 1930s is technocracy. And that's, you know, we see this, the policies being worked out in sustainable development and climate change and so on today. Uh, the patterns are unmistakable. You, you'll have, people have to trust me on this for now. Read my book and you'll see what I'm, why, I'm, why I'm saying this. The Trilateral Commission has been the action group that has brought us all this stuff that we're looking at today. They brought us Agenda 21 at the Rio conference in the first place. Uh, they brought us things like the Earth Charter. Uh, they brought us all the all the the dialogue on on um, or the, the the what do you call it the rhetoric on uh, climate change. Uh, Al Gore, for instance, the poster boy for climate climate change for Pete's sake. Remember the Trilateral Commission. Um, so we see these people's fingerprints all over this. And it's just, it's just astounding. You say, why would they be doing this? Or why, would they, why technocracy? Well, technocracy is about controlling resources. They want to take the resources away from people like you and me and even governments and even local governments and state governments and federal governments. They want to take the resources away and put them into a global trust for the common good. This is a master scheme. This is, this is the end game, if you will. We don't see it. We don't see it quite yet, but you can, you, you can clearly see it if you look at the UN closely enough. Um, land and resources that have, you know, like forest, farming, uh, oil, minerals, whatever, all these things are being locked up uh, away from, from our usage in any case. And climate change is being used as the fear-mongering tool to stampede people into the only solution that's being offered, namely sustainable development. Um, so it's a one-two punch. The trade treaties are coming in behind this. Uh, TPP, for instance, Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, the, the Transatlantic Investment and Trade Partnership, TTIP, coming right behind this one. 
same thing. Between those two treaties, 100% of the global GDP will be accounted for. They're writing a document that will put enforcement into sustainable development, and we will have no choice. And so, you know, why are they doing it? Well, once they get control of the resources of the world, they will have a monopoly, literally, on everything. Uh, the Rockefeller family, going all the way back to John D., has been a monopolist, monopolistic company. And I believe it was John D. that said that, cap that competition is a sin. But if sustainable development gets kicked in, they will control all of the resources everywhere and every kind of resource, not just oil, everything. And all you can figure it, when you look at stuff like this is that the inmates have escaped and taken over the asylum. They're, you know, they, they look straight. They, look, they wear suits and ties. They have their white coat or whatever. They talk with you know, four-syllable words. <laughs> and they, you know, they have a very serious expression on their face. If you look at it close enough, you realize they're, they're really the inmates in this mess. You know? They're just crazier than March hares. But you know, how they cannot confront these things is beyond me, other than just say they're, they're out of touch with reality. And also the suggestion, as has been floated for years and has been recently renewed by Bill Gates and others, is, of course, we need a carbon tax. And this steps in, uh, in line with another part of the, the technocracy agenda that you've noted, uh, the introduction of global taxation just one step away, using the Fuhrer over corporate tax loopholes to try to gar garner support for a UN-administered or other international-administered uh, taxation grid. And the carbon tax could be one foot in the door for the beginnings of that, the uh, thin edge of the wedge, as it were. Tell us about Absolutely. that agenda. Absolutely. <clears throat> the United Nations has been trying to get an autonomous source of income for 20 years at least. And they've tried kind of a frontal approach many times. But <clears throat> the, way, the way it looks like um, a global tax is going to be acceptable to everyone is everybody's pointing a finger at the global corporations who are evading taxes by moving assets around from Ireland to, you know, Holland. And I, what, I, don't, I don't understand the whole thing myself, but, you know, offshore uh, countries like the Cayman Islands and so on, they're able to move money around and avoid taxes in every country. And so, you know, every, uh, countries that impose taxes are getting sick of this, but they can't touch them. They can't, you know, America can't go to Ireland and do anything. You know, that's, just, that's their own country. But, if a global tax is proposed now to stop this and everybody in the world is taxed, I mean, there you go. You got it. It's in the bag. And they're working on it right now to get to figure out a way to do it. And if they do it for the major corporations, essentially it's going to be for everybody else as well. The cat will be out of the bag at that point. Unfortunately, that is the, the point, I think. Uh, of course, yes, everyone's angry at these these corporations that uh, that seem to skirt the grid. But of course, that just means they're going to tighten the noose around everyone's neck. Oh, don't throw us into the briar patch. Um, yes, again, it's about consolidation of power. And the only way to do that is to get popular support for that. So again, it's about fostering this popular support. Yes, and it's the same thing with uh, trying to get cash out of society right now, too. There's, there's big talk amongst the big banking institutions to, to eradicate cash altogether and have everybody go digital. Um, that, in my opinion, that would be catastrophic for a whole section of society worldwide. But... You know, they're talking about it and serious people, the big banks like the Goldman Sachs and the Deutsche Banks and, uh, you, you know, Bank of England, they're all talking about cashless society right now. They, you know, push everybody into the system. And the excuse they're using for this is, well, you know, there's people out there laundering drug money. And they're using cash to do it. Well, we can't have that. <laughs> you know, it's like, excuse me, I mean, how much of the world trade that you know, has to do with drugs. I mean, maybe it's a lot, but, you know, let them do business with credit cards if they have to. But, you know, to, 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 to use that as an excuse to take cash out of society everywhere is insane. Well, yes. I mean, especially since the CIA has been implicated in drug running over and over and over for decades now. And even officially the Senate has, uh, has admitted the CIA was involved in drug running in the, in the 80s. And that was from a Senate report chaired by John Kerry in the 1990s. So there you go. It's not it's not even a conspiracy theory at this point. But this is one of those things that's so institutional and broad and so detached from our everyday uh, sphere of, of influence. What can the average person who is concerned about this actually do to help derail this momentum? 
Well, <clears throat> I'll tell you as far as as far as America is concerned, for sure, I believe Americans need to get off their their lazy duff and get out and clean up their own community. This Agenda Twenty One uh, program has trickled down to every community in America. I'm just every one. It's just amazing. It's taken root. It's like a bad case of crabgrass in your lawn. And every community has this. And Americans need to wake up and quit shaking their fist at Washington or whoever they're going to shake their fist at and get out in their local community and kick this stuff out of their community and say, no, we're not going to do this. This is wrong. If there was even 100 communities in America who did that, who really, really cleaned up their own communities and transformed them back where they should be, constitutionally speaking, that would send a message up the food chain that they have a rebellion on their hands. Hi, I'm Alex Newman, and today I want to talk to you about the UN Agenda 2030, often called the Sustainable Development Goals, or the Post-2015 Development Agenda. So, in a nutshell, this is, uh, you know, to, to describe it simply, this is just a roadmap for global totalitarianism. It would basically create a global, centralized, technocratic, socialistic, communistic, whatever you want to call it, uh, regime under the guise of uh, you know all kinds of nice sounding things saving mother earth you know the document tells us it's going to heal mother earth uh, it also tells us that uh, we need wealth redistribution so it would create uh, this kind of totalitarian global government under the guise of saving the planet. This is an extremely dangerous document. If you read through it, what you'll find is that uh, this is basically every totalitarian's dream packaged with uh, you know a nice marketing package and it needs to be opposed. So let's go through some of the problems with this. Uh, I think a good place to start is goal number 10. Uh, now this goal calls for reducing inequality within and among nations. Now, how do you reduce inequality within and among nations? Well, of course, you do that with wealth redistribution. You take wealth from people who have it, and you redistribute it to people who don't. That's the idea. And it's not enough to just have national socialism. Here, they're talking about inequality between nations. And so what they're really plotting here uh, is... Uh, to transfer the wealth of what remains of the middle class and of course the poor in the Western world, the United States and Europe and Australia and Canada and uh, Japan and so on, and transfer it to third world dictators through the United Nations, which of course would take its cut. Now uh, obviously the, the real wealth, you know, the billionaires and the trillionaires are not going to be surrendering any of their money. They're coming after, you know, everyday average Americans. Now to get some perspective as to how much wealth they want to redistribute, consider that uh, the last official price tag I saw, which was uh, published by a Reuters propagandist, said they were going to need more than 170 trillion, with a T, dollars to implement this agenda. Now, not all of that would go to wealth redistribution to, you know, prop up third world dictators, but a lot of it would. So we're talking about a massive amount of money here. For some perspective, uh, the U.S. economy is about 17 trillion dollars per year, the GDP. So we are dealing with an enormous sum of money here that would completely restructure structure of the world. And actually the document makes this pretty clear all throughout. It says that no one can be left behind. And when they say no one, they mean no one. Not a single Indian living in the Amazon rainforest, not a single American living in the Blue Ridge Mountains. No one can be left behind by this crazy UN agenda. Now uh, some of the socialists of the world, uh, the former head of NATO, actually a socialist, Javier Solana, he said that this would be the next great leap forward. Uh, and he published this in a Soros-funded propaganda organ. Uh, for those who remember, uh, the last great leap forward involved the deaths of tens of millions of people. Uh, it took place in communist China after the communists took over. Uh, they launched this great leap forward that was supposedly going to take the Chinese uh, people forward. It actually, it just killed a lot of them. And uh, David Rockefeller later went to communist China. David Rockefeller is a big uh, sustainability globalist guy who admits in his book to conspiring with uh, secret cabal against the interests of the United States to create a one world system. Uh, he wrote in the New York Times after going to China that the uh, social experiment under the butcher communist mass murderer Chairman Mao was one of the most important in all of history. Now uh, the communist Chinese dictatorship has actually come out and proudly bragged about its role in creating this, uh, this Agenda 2030. They said they played a crucial role in developing this crazy UN agenda for wealth redistribution. Uh, other parts of this 
agenda. We could go to goal number four, for example, which deals with education. Now, uh, read this document. Read Agenda 2030. It's not all that long. Anybody can read it. And they tell you in here that they're going to brainwash your kids. They tell you that all the children need to be uh, so-called educated so that they have the knowledge and the skills necessary not just to accept sustainable development, but to promote sustainable development. Now, sustainable development is this UN ideology. I was actually at the UN Conference on Sustainable Development in 2012 down in Rio de Janeiro. And, uh, you know, just to give you some idea of what this ideology is about, you know, I, I, there was one poster that encapsulated it perfectly. Uh, it had a sick earth, an anthropomorphic earth with a thermometer out of it, sticking out of its mouth. And then the doctor came and said, I know your problem. You have humans, as if humans are a disease, right? What do you do with a disease? Well, you try to eradicate it. You try to destroy it, right? And so uh, they're treating humans here as a disease that needs to be dealt with. Now, this uh, document says it's going to heal Mother Earth by uh, imposing this sustainable development vision on us. It says that uh, children and uh, young people are critical agents of change to bring about this sustainable development transformation. So what they're talking about here, and they, they say we need vaccines for all and government health care for everyone and abortions for everyone, right? They say reproductive and sexual health, and everybody knows that means abortion. They haven't been shy about talking about that. So they're talking about a global totalitarian government that would redistribute wealth, that would control the entire economy, right? In this document, they talk about uh, that we need to change the way we consume and produce things. Uh, you know, the only way to do that, of course, is to control uh, using government the way that things are produced and consumed. So we are dealing here with a very dangerous document. Now, on the bright side, uh, despite all the praise from third world dictators, right? Robert Mugabe, the uh, genocidal Marxist mass murderer who's enslaved uh, Zimbabwe, uh, he said this is going to usher in this wonderful, he called it a brave new world, right? A brave New World. That's what Robert Mugabe said, and he thought it was great. Uh, I mean, the document is just packed with crazy extremism, and so it's no wonder that the dictators of the world love it. We need to stop it, though. And fortunately for us, uh, this is essentially meaningless as it relates to the United States. Obama knew that there was no chance the U.S. Senate would ratify this monstrosity, and so uh, he just signed it as this kind of executive agreement. Fortunately for Americans, executive agreements are actually non-things, right? These don't really exist, so Obama's been trying to implement this uh, using executive orders and all kinds of other stuff. But uh, the Trump administration has taken a pretty hard line on the United Nations. He, Trump called the UN uh, enemy of freedom and an enemy of the United States. So, so uh, you know, why would you want to imp implement the Agenda 2030 of your en enemy, of the enemy of your country, of the enemy of freedom? Well, you, you wouldn't want to, right? So let's hope for the best. But we need to get busy, we need to oppose this, we need to educate others, we need to be in communication with our members of Congress to make sure that this monstrosity is stopped in its tracks.